So I figured we'd start the conversation off talking about you being a student at BYU, where you were aspiring to be a columnist for the school's newspaper. And I read somewhere that you wrote approximately 200 columns in advance. Is that true? It is true. Uh, I can't attest to the quality of those, uh, of those you know, pieces, but they were basically uh, like a thought for the day. Uh, I haven't been asked about this, I think in any, any interview I've ever done, uh, but it's a fun place to start. Um, and, and they were just, the, the column was gonna be called Just a Thought. And it was just sort of a little, little thought for the day. It came from a manuscript I was writing at the time uh, sort of a book on the side. And I thought, oh, there's a way to do this. And they asked for a whole series of them. And so I, I sort of took the content and I divided it up and I thought, I think we've got something here and uh, handed them all in. I don't remember if it was 200, but it was a lot of columns. Uh, it was a lot. It might have been that number. And uh, what happened is that only one ever got published. That is, that is not a promising start to one's career. Um, somebody else in the organization, literally, I mean, it was on, like they announced it front cover of the paper. They had the first column in there. And then somebody else in the administration was like, time out. We do not do uh, columns. We don't have columnists. Uh, basically, I think they'd had a columnist that they had some few, few troubles with. And, uh, and so they didn't want to restart that. Uh, and so, I mean, I remember the meeting I had with them and, and, and they, 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 there's this conflict between these two leaders, one that had approved it and one that's saying no. And the person who said no looked at the next column and she was like, oh, well, this is actually quite good. Uh, anyway, we, we, we can't do it. So that was it. So I leave her office and I remember thinking, um, just for like a moment, just like complaining about it, like, for goodness sake, I've just done all this and then it's nothing. I was saying to one of my roommates who was driving me and and I felt distinctly this sensation of like, stop, you just don't complain. There's nothing to complain. It's all going to be fine. This is good. Basically, good will come of this. I, I like the feeling I got, the thought in my mind was like, I will make this work for you, sort of a sensation. And, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe so. Do you know the rest of the story? Yes, but you can, you can finish it off. <laughs> so you were asking it with purpose, I see. Um, so, so then, I mean, as it turns out, um, Anna uh, Worthen uh, wrote, read this article. I didn't know Anna at the time, but a few days later, coincidence struck in a variety of ways and we met and, uh, and, 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 now, and now I'm married to Anna. I mean, that's the, that's the if you cut out the last 20 years, uh, that is the conclusion of the story. Uh, and so it, it was, and if she hadn't read that that day, we wouldn't have met, we wouldn't have known each other, there wouldn't have been a connection. And as it turns out, uh, about a, a few months after she'd read this article, she was also in the paper, a uh, big spread of her beautiful picture, everything. And I'm like, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is someone special. So that newspaper played a role in our marriage and all the great things that have come since then. So best person I ever met, wisest person, smartest person, this just fantastic. That is such an incredible story that that was the reason why you guys met her, or at least in part. What was that article about? The article I wrote or the article mm -hmm. that she, yeah. The article I wrote was, was really about your unique mission in life. Uh, and so the cover story, there was two things. There was a cover story sort of introducing this column that never was. <laughs> and in that, it just kind of told my story about how I, you know, they had been asked, how did you even get to be in the United States? And that itself was a little bit of a story. And, and the story was that I, I was studying at law school. Uh, and then someone said, well, if you do decide to stay in America, then you should, you know, ABC. And, um, and, I never went and did, they, they said, oh, you should join this committee, this consultation committee. And I never did that, but, but their question made it possible, plausible to do something different uh, with my life than I was doing. And so I brainstormed, what would you do if you could do anything? And when I was finished, I look at the list and I noticed that not what I'd written down, but what I hadn't written down, that law school wasn't on the list. And I was at law school in England. And so what do you do? And so, so what I wanted to do was teach and write. I mean, that's it. 
That's the phrase. I just want to teach and write. And not just anything, but around, you know, leadership principles and, and, and principles that I thought could make a difference to people. And, and uh, so that was kind of the, the direction. But law school was in the way. So I call my, call my parents, my mother answers, fortunately. She listens for a while. She says, look, I think you better talk to dad. He comes on the phone and, uh, and he, you know, uh, he, he actually gave me some pretty good advice. You know, do what is right. Let the consequences follow. And that surprised me in a way. I thought maybe I'd get more pushback, but it was the right advice at the right time. And, and that's it. I mean, that's, that's, sort of the, that's, what, that's the story that Anna read about. Uh, was this person on a mission and the thing that got her attention um, wasn't it, the thing that got her attention was that she felt like that in her life that she had a sense of mission she was uh, training to be an actress at the time and you know everyone's like well why are you doing you know what are you going to do with that and you don't have a good practical answer for that necessarily but she just felt like a sense of mission to do it and so that that was sort of the thing that has both then and still now just aligns us completely is we both see life as a mission, a unique mission, uh, a mission that we're on together as well now. Uh, and, and that's a different perspective. I mean, to use essentialist language, it's just like, what's your essential mission in life? We each have one, it's unique to us. It's our highest contribution if we can find it and pursue it. Have you always felt a sense of complete alignment with Anna on your visions together? Um, it's an, it, I mean, in the way I just described, yes, uh, that sense of that, that big picture commitment that life is a mission, uh, that we came to earth with purpose, uh, that life and part of that life's purpose is figuring out <laughs> what we're supposed to be doing. Um, we, we've had, we do have total alignment about that. Uh, in terms of, do we always have alignment all the time? No, I mean, it's a constant process. Uh, I would summarize it this way, that there's sort of two types of people in life. There are people who are lost, um, and then there are people who know they are lost. Uh, and, and so what I think we share even now is a commitment to be in the second category, uh, to admit it every day, to not just go, well, that's what, we've always, that's what we've been doing, we'll keep doing it, or not, well, that's what the neighbors are doing, so we'll do that. But to just keep, we go and walk, um, most days we'll go on a walk. Uh, and when we, when we go, uh, that's what we're talking about. What's, what's going on in your life? What's going on in your life? What are we supposed to be doing? What's the right thing? What, what do we feel like we're being pulled to, called to our mission, our sense? Of, and that's the conversation. So that conversation never changes, but the answers do. And so it is being sort of in the wrestle of life, being in the arena to keep asking those questions and to keep working on them so you get clarity. And when we get clarity, when we're both on the same page, when we really go, we both know this is the next thing and we can see it clearly. It's like superpower. We're, we're far, far more powerful when we're unified than if you just have both of us clear but working on different things. When we're, when we're together, like you know, miracles happen. That is, that is my experience, yeah. Speaking of superpowers, you gave me the perfect opportunity to ask about stormtroopers. What is a stormtrooper? <laughs> well, I mean, the stormtrooper in our in our family is uh, is is a is a metaphor. Uh, we everybody knows what a stormtrooper is, literally, right? But but I, I you know it started when I was staring at myself in a costume shop uh, around Halloween, dressed head to toe in a you know really expensive movie quality. Uh, stormtrooper costume and I'm just looking at myself in the mirror and I'm like how did you get here it's like that song you know uh, whose house is this why how did you get here I don't know the name of the song do you know what I'm talking about when I say that or is that just a weird answer now all right doesn't matter um, <laughs> but 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 he but he uh, now I want to find that out now I've got to get the name before the end of this anyway it was like this out of body moment like what are you doing not one part of you wants this so how are you here and, uh, and how I was there when I sort of did a little, when I pulled the thread to get all it back is that I was um, like 30 years before Return of the Jedi had come out, uh, the hype of Return of the Jedi. And my, one of my older brothers, Spencer said, uh, wouldn't it be so great if we had a movie 
like literally said, a movie quality, like Stormtrooper, that would be so cool. And something about that just, you know, in, inside, that would be so cool. I would, that, wow. And somehow in the very subconscious level that was in my head for all these years, and then I'm still living it out 30 years later. And I realized this goal, this intent is no longer serves me. And so that just becomes a shorthand that Anna will say to me sometimes now, if I'm pursuing something that, that it just doesn't really seem essential, I could get even hyper-focused on it. You can be very focused on something that's non-essential. Uh, and she'll just ask that, like, is this a stormtrooper? And so, so you can broaden that beyond that to so much clutter that we keep, so to speak, in the back of our head. So we're not very conscious of, but it still uses up energy. It still can make, it still clutters up our focus. It still burdens us emotionally. And things that burden us emotionally burden us physically. There's a physical out reality of that. Physical, you know, emotional stress produces stress in our bodies, drains us faster than if, uh, you know, if we, if we don't have all of that. And so it just makes life harder than it needs to be. All sorts of assumptions that are not true or unhelpful. I was just talking to Tim Fer Ferriss on his podcast, and I asked him, how much of your mental and emotional energy is being cluttered up, drained in your life by grudges, by anger? And he said 60 to 70% of wow. him aged 15 to 30, so that 15-year period of his life, were consumed with those unhelpful, uh, unproductive, uh, draining, uh, you, you know, gr grudges and anger. So like, it's the ultimate productivity hack. If you can reclaim some of that, if you can suddenly sort through all that junk, get rid of, let go of the, the things you're angry about, let go of the things that you, you haven't forgiven people about, uh, get rid of the outdated assumptions that aren't serving you anymore. I mean, it's an enormous benefit to get out of a state of suffering and move into what I call now in the new book, the effortless state which I see as being a natural state is sort of the natural, it's like where we belong is all you need to do is just declutter all the stuff that's getting in the way. It's the natural state of things. And we just have to unload all this stuff, learn how to do that so that we can be fully present here and be at ease in focusing on what really matters most. What are some of the ways someone can identify their own stormtroopers before yeah. they actually have to go to the store and put on that stormtrooper <laughs> outfit? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a few things here. I mean, one of, the, one of the most simple things we can do is ask a new question. So, so it, it, particularly with the book Effortless, what I'm trying, what, what one of the, the core ideas is, is that we are brainwashed into believing that if it's worth doing, it's hard. If it's really important, it's got to be really hard. I mean, we have like catchy phrases, no pain, no gain. That if you're not exhausted, you're not doing enough. If you want to be successful, you have to work hard. If you want to be really successful you have to basically kill yourself i mean these this is like a whole mental model it's a whole set of assumptions it's stuff in the back of our head is it true it's not even question it's just there i I've, i just heard i just started to work on a, a really exciting new committee project um for youth around the world and i remember somebody just saying in passing they did so many things right and then just at the end they just said now, this is really important. Uh, we, this can make a difference to millions of people. It's going to be really hard work, but it's going to be really, really worth it. And I just am noticing now, because I haven't read, written this book and researched it, how like that went unquestioned. It was just assumed if it's worth doing, it's going to be hard. But does it have to be hard? What if it doesn't have to be? So this is the question. This is the, the one tactical thing people can do uh, is start creating, cl cleaning out that, all those mental models by just asking, well, what if it could be effortless? How could this be effortless? What if this could be easier? The, 
the, the, the, that can be applied instantly. Somebody right now, they could pause this and they could just ask it of anything they're doing in life. The next activity they do, if it's an essential activity, that's even better, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be the next thing that's on their list. They just say, well, okay, what do I want to do? There's an example, I'm sitting here in the office, so it made me think of it. On the floor over there, for two weeks, a printer sat there, and every time I'd look at it, it wasn't like really hard, hard to solve it, but it was a bit like, uh, what do I do with that? It's just a little mental exertion. That's what effort is. It's mental exertion. And it's like, oh, but do, do I sell it? Do I give it away? Do I throw it away? I've got a new printer. If I throw it away, I need to send it to a recycling center. I don't know where that is. Oh, my goodness. And that's just enough. All that happened in two seconds. It's enough that I didn't engage in it. I was like, oh, skip it. Go to something else. And then I was like, no, but hold, ask the question, what if it could be effortless? And I look up and I see some workers outside and I'm like, I wonder if they would want that. Walk out, do you want it? Yes. Walked in, got it, gave it to them. That was it. Within two minutes asking the question, I didn't have the solution. The solution was executed. And, and it, that I could point to so many examples now of that because I'm asking this question every day. It's like effortless stacking. You just keep asking the question and you find that there's these, all these solutions you weren't thinking of before. So I think that asking that question is one way to just cleanse out some of the cluttered assumptions that make life harder and more complex than it needs to be. In reading Effortless, I noticed that part of the reason why it came to be was because you were living an essentialist life, but <laughs> it wasn't enough and you <laughs> needed to do it more. How did it feel when you came to that realization of, oh my God, the system that I've been talking about on podcast for the past five years isn't working. Like, how does that feel as an author? Actually, it didn't feel bad in the way that I think maybe you, you would assume it did. It, it felt pretty good because, because what, it, what it said was, like, I wasn't unaware of the challenges in my life. I, I was very aware of those. This just gave me permission to look beyond it. You know, it's like, it's like, yeah, this is, you know, I mean, essentialism, what done it? It, it? Essentialism came with all these opportunities, great things, exactly what I wanted. It changed everything. I'm traveling the world now. I take children, one of my children with me about 80% of the time. It's great experience for them, for me. But this, I'm wanting to do the things that are on my plate. I have four children by this point. So, you, you know, you, that's, that's, you want, I want to do I, I want to spend time with them. I want to coach them. I want, like, it's not a motivation problem. It's just, you start to go, well, yeah, but what if there are actually too many essential things? They, they are really essential. They are important. They're part of your mission in life. They're part of your, you know, responsibilities you, you want to have so that you don't say, oh yeah, well, that child, you know, I'll just put them down for, you know, put them down for a year. I don't want to put a child down for a year or a month. I mean, like, I want to be doing this. So it actually, although it was quite painful in one sense, maybe took me longer to admit it maybe than, than if I'd not written essentialism. Um, I found it liberating to say, well, we've got to find another way. I mean, the, the tipping point thing was that in the midst of all this that was going on, I mean, I was being more selective than I'd ever been. I wasn't writing the next book. I wasn't doing a workshop business as I felt obliged to do. Uh, I just stopped the work that I was doing at, um, uh, put on pause the a class I'd co-created at Stanford. Yeah, so I was being very selective in that sense, being an essentialist, uh, but there still was too, too much. And then uh, one of my daughters, Eve, got really sick. And so that became like a family crisis on top of everything else. And so using the big rocks theory metaphor, the idea is if you put the big rocks in first, then it all fits beautifully. If you, I'm sure you know the metaphor. If you, you, well, I put the big rocks in first and there's still too many rocks, but it doesn't fit. It breaks the, it breaks the metaphor. What happens if you have too many rocks? A lot of people are in that right now. Not just me at that moment. The pandemic has done it to a lot of people where they suddenly have just more responsibilities than they can fit into their time. Well, what do you do? give up on something essential, you must find an easier path. And that's really was part of the, the, the genesis for writing, uh, for writing effortless was, was I need to find 
ways to make the essential things easier and ultimately like even the easiest things to do so that they'll happen whether i have a lot of energy or a lot of willpower today or not it is it's just built into the into the system that it works and is 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 is, is easy to do as is humanly possible and that has been really important for us it's been a thrilling ride and and now i am I've been burdened by this sometimes, but now I'm just excited to be able to share it with people because uh, I think a lot of people feel the same challenge. Yeah, you mentioned energy just now. And one of the things that struck me when I was doing research for this conversation by listening to you on previous podcasts mm. was your energy. And mm. I, was, I was like, wow, this dude reminds me of me. I, I, I feel like I have a lot of energy. It looks like he has a lot of energy. So I want to know, where do you think that energy comes from? Oh, yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I, think, I think I could summarize that, that I feel like I'd be pretty um, average uh, and, and maybe even you know, low energy on many, many things, like most things. So unless, unless I feel a sense of mission, I'm pretty rubbish. I'm like, a, I'm like an amoeba on all sorts of things. Oh, I just cannot even, you cannot even lift a finger for that thing. Like, it, it's only because I'm, I really do feel that what I'm doing professionally and then in my family and then even in community and church work that I'm involved with, I just am like, yeah, I came here to do this. And nothing is better than that feeling. I do not know of anything that will energize you faster or more consistently than feeling that you are doing what you came here to do, that you have a purpose, you have discovered some of it, you have some new essential errand, you, 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 this matters right now, it's the right thing at the right time. And, and so that's where I think the energy comes from. The one additional piece to add into that is that to do it in the right way makes the most of that energy. And, and that's really the distinction between essentialism and effortless. Essentialism is about doing the right things, but effortless is also do it in the right way so that you can make it to the end of that journey. So you can get the project done, the task done, or in the big picture, get your life's work done. But it really matters. If you burn out at 70 and you've got 90 years worth of mission to live, that's not a good situation. <laughs> if you burn out at 40 or 30 and you've got a whole life ahead of you, that's not, you haven't designed it right. You want to be around to be able to do that work for the totality of the, the this precious life we have. Yeah. So in the book, you mention bringing joy and and the the twenty ways you and your wife came up with bringing joy to your life. So you mentioned a couple in the book, but I was curious if you could could list a couple of other. What ways do you bring joy to your life today? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, the context for this is, so in the book, there's three, there's three parts to this model, right? The effortless model, and the, 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 they're important. They're three concentric circles, effortless state, effortless action, and then effortless results. And if I had to choose one of them, I would just say effortless state's the most important because it's the beginning point. It's the place you want to keep coming back to. And out of effortless state grows an effortless action and then because of that, you can get these repeated results that flow to you. And part of effortless state is to make life as joyful as you can. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is like, well, I mean, it's, well anyway, I mean, if you, if you have to choose between drudgery and joy, then you want to have a joyful path. Um, the, 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 so so the, the key in many instances is to, is to not falsely separate well, I got to this work to do that's drudgery. I mean, I don't want to do this work, but I got to, you know, I'm going to do it because I, I want to be paid for doing it. Or uh, so it's like, it's like what you're doing is you're saying, I'm doing this now. I don't like it, but because later I'll like something I get from it. Right. That's one approach. What I, one of the things I'm advocating in this book and one of the chapters on, you know, on making things joyful is what if you just combine them? If you take the thing that's essential and you make it enjoyable, uh, then that becomes, relatively speaking, more effortless. And, and there's all sorts of things. I mean, one of the things that, that I talk about in, in, in the book, I'd, I'd heard it from someone else first, but I started implementing it myself, is, is you get back from some trip or you've, you, and you've got a series of phone calls to make, um, and I can make it here in the office, 
uh, and that's fine. But you could make it more enjoyable. One of the things I love to do, and I do absolutely love to get in the hot tub. Uh, the hot tub. I mean, that's nice. First world, nice thing to have. But but it's it's outside. It's in nature. It's like blue sky. We're here in California, north of Malibu, and and yeah, I still sit here thinking, oh, my phone calls. Well, it's a phone. I've got to be here if it's a phone call. And I'm like, why, why does it have to be? Who made that rule? I mean, I work for myself, I'm an entrepreneur and I still live by that rule. Like, I, why do I have to live by that rule? It, it can be, it, it, it can be, so that's one thing that I love. That's a, a specific thing in the hot tub. And so I just combine that with phone calls often uh, and have meetings certainly with its members of my team, uh, but also, also other people too. Sometimes they're a little surprised by it, uh, but I put it in the book so that they wouldn't be less surprised in the future. It's great. Why not? Why can't it be fun? Why can't life feel more like an adventure? You can't make everything easy, but you can make things a lot more enjoyable if you have the mindset to do it. So that, that would be an example. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples for you. I mean, I already mentioned going for a walk with Anna. I love, I love doing that. I don't have the list in front of me, but we literally do have a list for each other. Uh, and um, I mean, I have certain, uh, certain foods I love. Uh, you know, Anna, my, my wife Anna loves dark chocolate. I, I've had my fair share of that now because of being married to her. So I'm like over. There's a certain point where dark chocolate is no longer. I don't know. It's no longer chocolate. There's a certain point. So I'm not living that, but she does. And that's that's one of the things is that the list that she has too, or that I have from her, means if I say, hey, I'm going to design a day for her. We've got a half a day together, or we're going to take a day off, or we're going to take a weekend off. I can look at that list and think of the things that she likes and combine them to make an especially enjoyable day for her birthday. I have, oh, what to do? Well, just look at the list. These combine any of these together, you're going to have a good, enjoyable day. So anyway, that's kind of the, the building blocks of joy you were asking about. So Benjamin Franklin had, I think, 13 virtues that he would check off every day. And it sounds like joy would be one of those for you. What are some other virtues or or feelings that you would like to experience on a daily basis? Uh, I think the most um, just resilient uh, virtue is, is, to, is gratitude. I used to think of gratitude when I was younger. I used to think of it as a sort of a soft principle. Like, yeah, it's good. It's nice to have. And, and I, 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 I am grateful. Uh, but I didn't understand it at all. It's the most you know, if you had to put virtues as sort of liken them to substances, I mean, this thing is diamond strong. Uh, this, this is, this is incredible. It is so much more powerful than I think is typically understood and utilized. Uh, it will make any situation lighter and instantly. Um, so in the midst of, I mean, I alluded to it earlier on, but in the midst of the, this, you know, multi-year, um, well, two years, I guess that's multi, uh, two years of, of uh, neurological problems that my daughter suddenly has, like neurological disease with no diagnosis. Uh, you know, that's the stuff that life, he, he, suffering and agony can be made of. And the temptation was very strong to just fall into a state of suffering. And it, Somebody just shared this with me. They've gone to, done spend time in India, and and they've been taught there um, that that there's really only two states in life: uh, you either state of suffering, or I think what they said was a state of, I don't know, state of beauty. I think that was the term they used. But that's really what I'm trying to say about the state. It's like you're in a state of suffering and exhaustion and burnout, or you're in a state, an effortless state. And gratitude is the fastest way to shift between it. And in the midst of this sort of what could have been agonizing suffering state, by saying what we were thankful for uh, quickly and relentlessly, anything. Well, we're thankful that, uh, that, that, that a neurologist wants to see us. We're thankful that Eve's alive. We're thankful that we can be together, that we can sing together, that we can play together, that we can laugh together, that we can pray together, like all of that meant that, and it wasn't just somehow me doing that. That's, what, that's Anna, my wife doing it. That's our children doing it with each other. It meant that the experience we had, and even now, first, I don't even know if people can believe us. And because partially I can hardly believe it myself is that that experience was most 
closely defined as an experience of joy. And that's just unthinkable that I'm saying that. And there were, there were tears. I'm not saying we, there was no like putting this experience in a box. We weren't pretending. We were living it. But we just weren't making it harder by adding suffering to the challenge. And so this, you know, gratitude, it's very specifically, this is based on BJ Fogg's work at the, uh, the design lab at, um, uh, the behavioral lab, excuse me, at Stanford that he, um, I think, founded. Um, and uh, it, he, he, he has what he calls a habit recipe, which is if I X, then I will Y, or after I X, then I will Y. As we came up with a behavioral thing for us, which is after I complain, then I will say something I'm thankful for. As soon as I did that, I realized that I was just way more into complaining than I realized. I just, just, just the easy, it's, it's like so easy. That, that, that pattern of expression, that soundtrack in my life was just so much more well-worn than I noticed. It is that everywhere I go into a room, I just, oh yeah, that took a lot longer than I thought. And, oh yeah, I've got this going on. It just was like, just there, unaware of it. You know, just like what we were saying with the stormtrooper, all that stuff is just there. And so I, so I just thought, okay, I'm going to link something grateful with this pattern that's already in existence. I'm going, to, I'm going to add, it's like mixing a new soundtrack, you know, mix in a new beat, a new piece uh, to, to, to the existing sound. And, and it was just immediate, the effect. Uh, I, I, people's fa families' faces light up. I feel better. I start to see opportunity. We start to see things we didn't see before. That makes you materially better able to handle whatever challenges you're actually dealing with. Relationships are intact, you can work together. And there's this positive upward spiral and cycle. So you just cannot overdo this. I don't believe there's like a point, but we're just too grateful. Well, and if there is like, I mean, I'll let you know. We'll, we, can, we can all, to, but we're nowhere close to that. So we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so, so we just, uh, yeah, that would be one of the virtues I'd add to the list. I'm sure you it's one of his actually. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to check that after, but yeah, it is. I'm, I guarantee it is. <laughs> you mentioned, you know, your, it wasn't just you who was full of gratitude in that moment. It was your kids and, and your wife. How do you teach that to your children? Um, well, with, I mean, you, obviously you have got to model right? You've got to start living something. But I think in addition to that, you can tell, you, we, we can tell our children, I have learned this. I have noticed I am complaining way more than I realized. And so I'm going to be working on gratitude. I'm going to be trying to do this really deliberately, just sharing the, the failure and the, and the learning. But also we've started all sorts of games around this. I mean, the, the experience for them starts like this though. It's, it's, I walk into a room and instead of catching them doing the wrong thing, which is totally in front of you. you. You could do that all the time with any age children, but teenagers now, we have four of them, teenagers. Uh, why aren't you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why have you got, I mean, you could start that way. And so it's a good change of culture to suddenly have you walk into a room. Hey, thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. It's instant. I'm telling you, you don't have to like, Oh, we'll wait for we'll wait for a year for this to have an effect. I mean, it's it happens at least for us within three seconds. As soon as you catch someone doing something right, gratitude has a, a reinforcing thing. So you start to then see someone else, and the mood has already improved, and now they want to do the same. And we we started something a family star chart game. It's not a very creative term in the title, is it? But but it's different than your it's different than the average parents star chart. And here's how. We agree together on something we all want to do. Okay, we want to go see Chaos Walking was the, the, the last one. I, I don't, I'm not saying everyone has to see Chaos Walking, but, but that was one that they, you know, the kids want to see. So that's the, that's the out, we're agreed. That's going to be the output. Then they've got this chart. Every time any of us find any of us doing something we like, we can give them a star, right? Which just means you color in a block, right? You know, and it kind of looks cool by the time it's done. Um, and you can't take away star, like you can't take a point away if they're doing something wrong. So there's no downside. So you've created an asymmetric game. There's only upsides to this. There's no downside to the game. And we've started even having it so that they can give them to each other. Um, so it isn't just mom and dad's thing. It's like, it's, it's our thing. 
And whenever our family culture starts to feel a bit ungrateful or a bit a bit grouchy, which, you know, mostly means I was going to say Anna and I, but that seems rude to Anna. But you know, if, we, if 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 I start to get a bit, one one of the children will come to us and say, "Hey, let's do it. It's time for another star chart." You know, even as teenagers, they'll initiate that because it is better. It is easier. It does help life's inevitable burdens be lighter. And, and that's the idea of effortless. What if everything doesn't have to be so hard? What if you could be grateful in all things? It, you find that, that life's more doable that way. Uh, you, there's nothing so hard as complaining about it won't make it harder. And Jeffrey R. Holland said that, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing or stealing it one way or the other, but, but, but I love that. That's a great idea. So don't make life harder than it is and harder than it needs to be. And gratitude would definitely help your culture, whatever family, team, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial group, you, you just go for gratitude, you're going to get great results. On the point of, of the why, why isn't it easier? I wanted to share a story with you that I came across in the past week. Um, have you heard of the song Mood by 24K Golden? I don't think so. So tell me. So, now so I'm it's have to listen to it though. It's it's the number one song in the world, and I it's okay. Now I feel you, old that I don't know. I, I just I, ruined that moment. I, wait, 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 wait! I didn't know it either before hearing this story, but right. the story shook me. So, huh. basically, the artist was saying how he, how the song came to be, and someone was asking him how did the song come to be, and mm -hmm. he said. Well, you know, I wish I could take all the credit for it, but what happened was I was playing video games. My friend comes in with the guitar and he starts playing along and he starts singing and all of a sudden his friend says, stop, we have to record that. And that turned out to be the number one song in the world. He yeah, was just, love that. he was just in his own zone, in his own element and not even thinking of anything. And the words come to him that turn into a song that's been played hundreds of millions of times. That's uh, your this. thesis, right? Okay, I think it is actually. Now, now I like want to just play some of this. Okay, hold on. I'm going to play some. Of Good vibes. Here right, we go. Here we go. Okay, I get. I, I get it. I like it. The um, yeah. I think that what you just said is it does go right to the heart of it because if you can get into that effort, the state. That's where creativity is. That's where good things happen. That's where, um, I mean, there's a theory behind this. Barbara Fredrickson is a researcher put, you know, named, it's called broaden and build. And it basically means once you get in positive emotion, it produces better options. So you can take better action and you're going to get better results. I mean, that's the summary. If you are in negative emotions, if you're in a poor state, then you will tend to see fewer options, you know, fight, flight, freeze. I mean, you're very limited in your options and in your relationships. And so then you are, you know, less able to take uh, effective action uh, and less, uh, less able to get good results. And, and this is the, the build part is that you are weaker as a person, your network is weaker to be able to deal with whatever the next challenge is. Uh, the next big challenge for us and our family was, uh, you know, like with everybody though, was the pandemic. And what I noticed and was surprised by and pleasantly surprised by was how intuitive uh, a response there was within the family culture that we automatically were like, okay, what can we be grateful about? What can we focus on? I mean, the principle is that like, when we focus on what we lack, then we lose what we have when we focus on what we have, we get what we lack. So it's like, it, 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 if you focus on the things that you have, it expands what you have. And I, I have experienced that many times. And I literally just want to go from now to the end of my life, emphasizing this, because what I, what I have seen is like a multiplier effect where as soon as you start being grateful for the things that you have, it's like, oh, you, you like that? There's an, old, there's an old parable around this. Something like, uh, you know, there's, there's the, the man's walking along the road and he's, he's complaining about something. And as, as the story goes, it's like God says to him, oh, you think that's hard? Let me show you what's hard. 
And then the next person is the same person who's walking down the road, same scenario. He says, uh, says, oh, I'm so grateful for that little thing. And he says, oh, you think that's something to be grateful for? Let me give you, let me show you this. And I feel that reality that what you focus on grows. What you focus on grows. That is a true thing. And so if you focus on what's going right, on what someone's doing right, if you talk about it, they'll tend to do more of it. That's true with teenagers, it's true with young children, it's true with teams, it's true with customers. I mean, you focus on what is going right, it expands, and people want to be part of that. And, and this is the key to momentum and a movement. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, I, I uh, somehow went back on gratitude, which is exactly, exactly right. <laughs> well, of course, that, that's the case with us two having this conversation. So it sounds very much like you are you know, leading your family but also it feels like it's a peer relationship between your family. You're not like looking down upon your children. You're, you're guiding them and with you're going along the journey with them. Is that an accurate representation from your point of view? And if say, so, no, how do no. you get to that point? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's the aspiration. Uh, I mean, I, you know, if my children weren't here, they could just, give you their view on it and and i would want i would welcome their view you know i'd welcome them saying well dad sometimes you do it like this i i think that's is so important like who else should give feedback who, who else who else would know what it's like to be uh to be uh you know to be my child but them i mean that i i need to hear it we we need to have enough safety and enough enough safety in the culture for that conversation to happen because you don't want it to be to be true and not to be spoken uh, then, then, then you can't make any progress. Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, I wish Anna was here too, to be able to weigh in because she's just been so good at this and been such a, a good model of, of what, we, what we aspire to. But one of the things we agreed on early that we again have alignment on is that because we think life is a mission, because we think that is a discernible thing, then it changes your framework on, on, parenting from the beginning because what you say is our job is not to get you to be like us right like we're not trying to create miniature versions of ourselves we're not trying to get you just to do what we think is the right thing in life the job is can we create an environment a culture where you can become what you're supposed to become so you can start to discern this for yourself so in a sense, the, 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 the point, like the job of a parent becomes this. Can you help your children to feel, recognize, and follow the voice of conscience inside of them? And once you have that as your focus, it's not, I would agree that, I don't know, peers is quite the right term, but it's definitely not command and control. You're not going for that. You're still, you're still responsible. You still want to provide discipline. It's not completely loose uh, in, in one sense, but it's, it's creating an environment where they can hear that voice within them. Uh, and, and once they can develop that themselves, then basically the job of parenting is done. Uh, or certainly your job shifts because your job is like more like a, you know, we're coaching they become teenagers like if, even if you could control children when they're young which i think is a i mean certainly not a good thing to do but but i'm not even sure if it's possible but even if you could do that there's certainly a tipping point at which you could not do that anymore you you, you know, they are going to be free they're going to be able to do the things they want so even if you tried to do that it's it's a limited use model uh and and so what you want, certainly before you can't do any of the control, is you want them to be able to make good choices for themselves. Um, so, yeah, that's that's Well, yeah, I want to keep riffing, but I better stop. I better stop. Back to you. <laughs> you mentioned the voice of conscious. I yeah. got to know, how do you listen to that voice of conscious yourself? Um, well, there's a series of practices uh, that I pursue and, and I'm, you know, I fail at this all the time. Um, so there's, there's plenty of ways I get it wrong. Uh, but I mean, it's, it, you know, practices include for me, you know, first thing in the morning, um, or I, I didn't do it today, uh, is, is like, 
you know, for me, it's reading scripture, but you know, I, what I would advocate for people is, is just whatever the wisdom so wisdom literature is for them, right? Whatever is the most inspiring thing, the thing that brings out the best in them, the thing that gets them to think about something beyond, beyond the pressures of this moment. C.S. Lewis talks about it. He says, when you wake up in the morning, it's like, it's like all those activities rush at you like wild beasts. And I have totally experienced that. I mean, I experienced that this morning wake up you know and then suddenly oh there's this thing and there's that important thing and there's this thing that i want to get done today and it just rushes you and so it's to try to at least push that out for a moment and to say okay let's read something you know meditation my wife has been introducing that as our family culture and so last night we did it you know just put it on the speakers in the house wherever you are you don't have to do it but for 10 minutes we can all do anything for 10 minutes and so we just do it and uh, that's been great. Um, I, you know, I, I do pray. Uh, I, I, I journal. Uh, that, that's the journaling for me is like mental. I mean, that's like such a good way to get all the stuff out, all the junk that's in your mind. I generally do use a gratitude structure uh, for all the reasons we've already talked about. Uh, but but I, again, I do that. It's almost like mental health for me. Uh, it just, I just feel a lot better. I had Benjamin Hardy on the What's Essential podcast recently, and he used this phrase, a Dan Sullivan quote, but they just co-authored a book together. And the phrase is, are you, it's a question like, are you in the gain or in the gap? You're in the gain or the gap? What they mean is when you're in the gap, you're thinking about what you don't have yet, what you haven't accomplished. You're comparing yourself against someone who has already done it. They're ahead of you or some way the gap. And he just said, look, if you try and pursue success that way, it's fine, but you will be unhappy. <laughs> if you're in the gain, which is what are the things that have gone right? What progress have I made? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, then you will, you know, it's not about how much progress you'll make, you'll just be happy while you're making it. And so I, I do this in my journal. Um, as I say, mental health, but also then as you're doing it, you're getting yourself back in this state. And in this state, that's when the voice of conscience is clear. When you are in a state of suffering, of anger, of frustration, when you're in a state of fear, anxiety, it, it, those are like loud voices, emotional, uh, heavy. And so it's much harder to hear that quieter voice that is, I think, ever present, but very calm. And you've got to be in a calm enough state, an attuned enough state to be able to hear it. And then it's there. It's always there, but it's a little quieter. Right, I'm going to cough again. Hold on one second. You're good. No worries. Well, there we go. Some water? You, you good? I probably should get some, but I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't come prepared. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Back to you. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned you were reading scriptures and scriptures is the first thing you read, but correct me if I'm wrong here. I sense some hesitation to say that. Was there hesitation to say that? And, and does it all come from the fact that religion is on a decline in the United States and worldwide? And it's like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, why do you think religion has been on a decline if it's proven to be so helpful to so many? Um, I would say that there is a growth, there is a, a much greater sensitivity around this subject than there has been uh, when I first came to the United States. I will say that in the 20 years I've been here, it is different. Uh, when I was first here, I felt like you could talk about these things as a sort of a common a language. Uh, that was just mutually understood, uh, and and I do think that now, yes, I'm I'm more. I mean, am I more hesitant now? I think I'm more aware of the sensitivity, and so I want just to be clear to people that I'm not saying, hey, I'm I'm advocating or pressuring you to do the practice I'm doing. 
but I do want to be open about what I have actually found to be useful. Um, and I mean, to your second question, why has it declined? I, I mean, I, there's, that's, a, that's a complex, there's lots to that. Uh, I, would, I, would say, I would say that there maybe has been, among other things, um, just a general continual transition away from formality in everything. Mm. And I think that is true also in religious formality. So the idea of going somewhere at a certain time, going to church, going to, uh, going to synagogue, you know, et cetera, um, is just, just not the thing. It's less done. And that, that is true. I also think there has been a, that there, is, there are some enormously powerful positive forces that are at play that I think you also have to acknowledge as you look at it. I, I don't think it's a great thing that there's few people involved in formal uh, religious rituals. I think that overall it is such a positive player for people to have a moment once a week Hey, I'm going to get away from this. I'm going to go through this, this, this collective ritual, have the support of a, a community. I see there's so many reasons that's a good thing. Um, but I also want to say, like, there are so many positive movements that have taken place and that are still going on right now. Uh, and, and, and I see them, like, the world over. I see them opportunities everywhere. So, again, they may be more informal than before, uh, but but they're still real, and and I see I see a great deal of good going on in the world, uh, and and in a sense, when I think I think a lot of people would describe that as a kind of awakening, a kind of spiritual awakening that people have a sense of a sense of our interconnectedness and the need for us to look after each other, uh, you know, globally. Um, so I I remain I remain optimist. Uh, about about the state of things and the inevitability i'll say it that way the inevitability that good prevails so you just mentioned a spiritual awakening and it's something that i've been thinking a lot about as well why do you believe that is going on um i believe um well i believe that that there is purpose in the in the in the creation of the world of the of the that it itself has a purpose and that we this so there's an inevitable improvement uh that is that seems to be a play uh and and an enlightenment that goes with it and even where we see the violation of those values which we do all of us all the time there's there's the strength in that too because we often only know our values in their violation. And so I think that there's, I just think, I would have a phrase that comes to mind is um, something that, P, uh, that, that um, uh, Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said uh, about his experiences with apartheid in South Africa. Uh, he, he said, I used to say to P.W. Both of the president of South Africa at the time to come and join the winning side. He said, all the, tear gassing the the police the soldiers the dogs the laws were all against us but he said he said i used to say come and join the winning side because he said there's no way that in god's universe good will not prevail and and i love that principle i love the way he expresses it and i love it as as we saw apartheid inevitably tumble because you cannot these these when you violate these principles uh, you you are in the moment have chosen to fail now it doesn't happen instantly but as soon as you violate them the consequences will eventually you know will, will eventually catch up uh, they, these systems cannot cannot survive in the long run uh, and and so i take the long the long view uh, is, uh, is that great, great good is happening in the world and will continue to. You mentioned on Tim Ferriss's podcast a couple of years ago that if you had a billboard anywhere, 
you would put the word light on it. And, yeah. and you mentioned that in every moment, there's a decision that takes place to step towards light or darkness. And it kind of reminds me of what we're talking about. Would you still put light on that billboard? Yeah, well, actually, I, I just was on Tim's podcast again. And so he asked me that question again. Oh man. And and so and I and I said the answer was yes. I would still put the word light on it, uh, but I would but I would just change the meaning of it. Um so there's you know, light has at least two definitions, and one is light versus darkness, which is what I meant the first time. Um, but also now it has another meeting, right? It's lightness versus heaviness. Uh, versus burden versus um, you know these other themes we've talked about and so in the same way as in every moment you can choose to go towards the light or the dark similarly in every moment whatever has happened to you whatever whatever terrible thing has been done to you whatever mistake you've made that has to this moment filled you with guilt and, and, and irresolution Whatever that is, they all of those things, as important as they are, pale in comparison to the power that you have in this moment to choose the lighter path or the heavier path. You can wow. you can always make life heavier in this moment, and this moment is this tiny little moment. I mean, it's uh, ne neurologists, neuroscientists, and psychologists have have wrestled with how long now is. We normally say the word now, but we don't really have a measurement to it. And, and one of the compelling answers I have to this is, is from my research is two and a half seconds. It's like two to three seconds that now is two to three seconds long. That's, that's so empowering. You know, we live our whole life in actually these sort of two and a half second increments. And we, we don't feel like that's what's happening in life because those moments have now combined together to make memory and anticipation of the future. But, what we actually have are these tiny increments, which itself is quite a, a freeing idea. You don't have to be so burdened by past and future. Uh, but, but it also gives you power to, to, to just, you know, like two and a half seconds is enough time to make a new choice. Two and a half mm. seconds is enough time to, to forgive someone, you know? Like, I, I forgive you. You can say that in two and a half seconds. I, I am sorry. You can... You can Ask for forgiveness in two and a half seconds. I'm sorry I did that. Uh, you can say, let's start over. Say, uh, say, I'm, I love you. <laughs> you can say, I mean, like these are all these tiny moments that are right in front of us and we can do it. So the next time that we start to feel burdened, it's like, forget all that burden. What do I do now? Next time you're in an argument with somebody. Oh, I'm in a, I'm in a huge argument. This thing could go, could escalate in a heartbeat. Just, hey, listen, I'm sorry. Can we just start over? Can we just time out? Let's take a break. We'll come back to this. Just use the next two and a half seconds to move towards a lighter moment. Two and a half seconds. What's an effortless solution? Just ask the question. These little incremental moments are, are incredibly powerful. I love how that answer made sense when you gave it two years ago, light instead of darkness, but it also makes sense in context of your most recent book. It's so fascinating mm -hmm. how that, that works out. Um, you often ask people when you're, when you're giving talks to describe someone who's completely present and a word to describe them. Um, who is that person for you or what is that moment? And what is the word for you? Who? Someone who is completely present for me. Uh, I mean, the first name that comes to my mind is is Anna, um, and the description is. I mean, with her, I would just say the words intimate. You know, mm -hmm. when when we are really present, I mean, it's emotional intimacy, and and that's really important to her, and it's important to me. So I guess that would be my answer. But I have a second answer because I was just thinking about this as you, as you asked, and my best friend growing up is Sam, his name is Sam Bridgestock. And, um, and we just spent our lives just kind of listening to each other. <laughs> I mean, we did, we, we had loads of fun and crazy stuff to, to along the ways, but we would talk to each other for hours each week. And it was just this, we didn't have any training in listening, but there was just this, 
there was this deep presence about that. Um, and I don't have the word for you, but it's like the, beyond whatever the word is, it's, it's deep for me. Mm. Like it really, really mattered and matters. And uh, very unfortunately, like saddest day of my life is that we just learned that he has um, cancer for a second time. His cancer has returned. And so we don't know what that means exactly. At first we thought it might mean literally as a year left and, and you never, you know, you never really know now. Um, but it makes it exceedingly unlikely that he, that he and I will just spend the rest of our lives being able to talk to each other uh, and listen and be present in the way that we, we assumed it was such an obvious assumption. We've never had to express that. We never said, Oh, it'd be great. Well, you'd be 70 years old and keep talking. I mean, you never, you don't talk like that, but now all of a sudden this assumption we had is like not there. And, and so you recognize the loss and I don't even, I don't even have, or I can't even put myself through this moment, the, uh, the, the emotion of what all that means to me, but, but it definitely goes to show that the being of presence, I mean, it's like, it's like to, to be known is maybe a human's deepest need to be understood, to be known, to be accepted. Uh, and, well, I'll say it this way. I'll say the word. I've got the word now, and it's home. And that's funny because actually most of the time when we were talking, when we were young, he lived actually a long ways from me, miles and miles away. And so it was often on the phone. So in one sense, it's a funny word to say. But wherever we are in the world, if we're talking, it's like coming home. And that's what the loss is for me, right? I mean, that's one of a hundred losses. But one of them is like, it's just one one less place to be home uh, in, in, in a world where you, we all want that. And uh, sometimes it can be, you know, relatively hard to come by. You mentioned listening as, as a skill that you were building without even knowing you were building it. What are some of the ways in which one could be a better listener? Uh, now you, you've hit on a, a true passion for me. Uh, before I ever wrote a book on essentialism or an effortless, I was working on a book on this. And, uh, and one day, you know, one day it will be the right time to, to, to write it. But, but I basically think that, um, well, let's just say it this way, right? We've all had years and years of formal and informal training in how to write, how to read, you know, even, <coughs> excuse me, even how to speak, um, give presentations and, you know, stand up in front of the class and, 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 and so on. But most people haven't had any formal experience at all in listening. So that means that you are limited to the experiences you happen to have with other people. And as I believe people are, you know, maybe close to universally rubbish, at powerful, deep listening, you know, what that means is that the experience all of us have, we just tend to have, you know, more frustrating experiences. We're lonelier as individuals. We're uh, less, um, you know, we're more disconnected. We create lots of problems because of the misunderstandings. And, and then you, you know, you, you multiply that between, you know, me and my children, my, my wife and our family, and then the families next door, and you can keep combining that. And you, you know, that's the stuff that a current cultural crisis is made of. It's just this total misunderstandings between people deeply and held with great conviction and a sense of real right and wrong. And that side of the aisle is, is wrong and I'm right and I'm morally better and they are, they are threat. And, and this is the stuff that like, if it, you know, conflict tends to escalate, conflict begets conflict. And, and if you don't, if you don't at some point shift the conversation to actually understand that somebody you currently don't trust, uh, then you just escalate until you actually have war and civil war and this kind of thing. And that's where war came, comes from. It doesn't come from nothing. Um, and so, so, you know, what can we do I mean, one of my favorite things is um, for this 
it comes from the Gottmans who say shelve your agenda. Mm. That means that when you're about to disagree with somebody or you're, you're starting to feel frustrated or you're, or even not that you're just going on a walk. Like I was saying before with my wife, or you, you say, okay, I'm full of my own thoughts, but I will shelve it for now. I'll just put it on a shelf. You're not throwing it away. You're just going, we'll come back to it, but I will just be in this moment. It's actually the most meditative experience I have in my life is doing that. You're just putting that aside and you're just basically going in and living in another person's world. And I find it, as I say, I find it meditative. I find it quite a healing process to just be in somebody else's experience and to listen to their world. And it's almost a visual experience for me where, I, where whereas I'm, I'm listening, I'm seeing visuals of the words they're saying. And there's, there's loads that there's loads here. There's so much power in this. Um, and so I think shelving your agenda is one really tangible thing you can just start doing immediately. Uh, and, and it's so much more efficient than the opposite. It doesn't feel it, but we've been conned. You, you, you try and get somebody who disagrees with you to hear your side of the opinion while they're doing the same thing. That is the most inefficient thing you can do. You will just escalate, escalate. No one will believe each other better. They'll feel more misunderstood. You make not an inch of progress in actual deep communication or alignment or unity or any of those things. So your power, you become powerless. You lose all your influence and they lose all theirs with your, you. So it's just like a total lose-lose. But if you can actually shelve your agenda, really deeply listen, get to the other side's perspective, you start to stop dehumanizing the other person. You see where they're really coming from. You start to be able to feel their true sense. You, have, you, you feel more humanity. It's easier to feel empathy and love for that person. And it just changes the whole dynamic. So yeah, there we go. Start with shelving your agenda. It's a good start. That's something that Malcolm Gladwell says to interviewers. When you are interviewing, forget yourself. And I mm. think it, it speaks not to just interviewers. I think it speaks to something we can all bring to every moment. Lastly, I want to ask- Yeah, but I, yeah. I pay a compliment to you about that because- because I've been interviewed hundreds of times and it's rare that you have someone interviewing you, perhaps because the very nature of an interview is sort of to have an agenda, but, but it is rare that somebody is actually listening in the way that we're talking about. And you're doing it. You've been doing it this whole time. And it's, it's a tangible difference. Uh, and, and I honestly, if I have to admit it, I would say that it's like maybe a dozen of the pe people I've been interviewed out of hundreds of times that I actually feel that. It doesn't mean they're not listening in the other instances, but that they are still full of the noise in their own head uh, is, is instead of actually hearing what was shared. And so as a result, what happens is you stay at a surface level and people effectively get the same stuff as everybody else got because they aren't really going any deeper. Go back which, is, which is what I was going to ask about. You've obviously done the interview with essentialism so many times and you, you're going to do the interview with effortless so many times. And because of that, you're going to skip over some parts and you're going to miss some of the nuance. What is some of the nuance you think is going to be lost when speaking about effortless? Um, I'm so new to sharing effortless it's an interesting experience. At the same point in teaching essentialism, there really weren't podcasts. I mean, they, there were still some, but it wasn't the same as now. So it's, it, it's like I had a, a longer lead time to just be teaching and sort of learning how to teach essentialism by speaking at events and that kind of more formal setting. Um, and, and, I think the main thing that I've learned in the interim period is that you cannot teach a book. You just can't. So you're only going to teach a few things, right? You can't teach in one hour. We can't discuss today one hour of what the whole book contains. So there's all sorts that I think will be missed. Um, what I want not to be missed is the humanity of the subject. Uh, I think I probably ought to be sharing more of the tips and practical things. There's a, there are a bunch of really practical things in the book. Uh, and I, I probably should be better at getting to those subjects. 
but but I I I want to say, look, I I think this message of effortless is so timely because of the pain that I feel, and I could be wrong about it, but when I like close my eyes and try and do what I would call like sort of I don't know, sort of like societal empathic listening, which I think is that you can do. What I sense is a lot of people burdened, a lot of people in pain, uh, quite exquisite pain, actually, a lot more than is obvious in just, you know, walking around and so on. The isolation, I think, is suffocating for an enormous number of people. I mean, like, the, 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 you know, the, the, the the scars of the pandemic, I think, are deep and real, and and a lot of people are burdened with them, and it's a lot of it's invisible, and they they feel like they can't even share any of it, and so this subject, I feel this obligation to be able to bring this forward because I actually think it is an alternative to what people have been doing over the last year, which is like grinding effort. They've managed to maintain certain results, but it's it's like come at a real cost to their deep reserves. Of, of energy, emotional, physical, spiritual energy. And so they come out of this, they're like on the edge of burnout or burned out. Like a CEO said to me just a week ago, 1,100 people in his organization. He said, yeah, everyone's burned out. That's, that's how he described it. Everyone's burned out. I know that's an exaggeration, but it's one that makes a useful point. That's what I want people to feel with effortless is that I want them to feel heard and seen and that, that like, it sounds a weird thing to say, but it's like, I wrote this book for you in that extremity, in that feeling, in that, even that privateness of like, how am I, on earth am I going to do it? The pandemic has increased the invisible work for working women by 150%. It's invisible. That's the point. That's what one of the things that makes it so painful is that nobody really sees it. No one's really acknowledging it. I, I want that feeling of effortless to be to not to be lost in the conversation it's a beautiful place to wrap it up thank you greg for your time your wisdom and i'm extremely grateful for you for bringing the book to life and for bringing this conversation to life where can people find more from you and the book um yeah look, i mean there's a there's a a podcast, we mentioned it, What's Essential Podcast. I, I've loved having these conversations with people, um, with other authors, uh, with, with you know, some big name people. But actually, my favorite thing is with everyday people uh, who just come on the podcast to talk about their experience. And we sort of do a little coaching session together sometimes as we try and figure out how to actually make lives, make what's essential more you know, as effortless as possible, right? That's the, the sweet spot. But I think that uh, people can go if they, if they want to get a little sort of jump start on this, they can, they can order effortless and they'll get um, a 21 day essentialism challenge for free. It's like a masterclass they can get if they go to essentialism.com, um, they, they can do that. Uh, and then there's a one minute Wednesday a podcast, uh, a newsletter that I put out for about the last year uh, so so anyway those are those are places to continue the conversation and I, I hope that they do because i think it matters and i think they matter 100 percent. thank you greg i really appreciate it Danny, thank you so much for having me